Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an incredible pleasure for me to introduce today a little bit of Kirill Martimianov. Uh, Kirill is the superstar, a young generation superstar of our field. Uh, he got Kogan Award, and uh, this is really something that one has to show uh, that deserve that award rather than to receive a award after accomplish something. So uh, Kirill was there uh, already selected to be a superstar in our field and really exceeding expectation, uh, fantastic work. Uh, almost every quarter or so, some new ideas, new directions and uh, extremely creative uh, work. So I am uh, truly, truly uh, delighted. Uh, we have uh, invited Kirill when I was in Cleveland, uh, I believe twice. Uh, and uh, now it's the tradition continues to uh, just to know what exciting and new is coming from his lab. So Kirill, keep going. Uh, again, we will tell you at the end whether you deserve next award from Arvo. Um, so you were given a, a, like a little bit a teaser. Uh, to making sure that uh, you will continue excitement uh, with vision research. With my bubbling uh, coming to the end, uh, let me uh, pass over to Arum Wu, uh, who will introduce Kirill. Thank you, Chris. Good morning. My name is Arum Wu, and I'm an Austin pro project scientist working with Dr. Paul Chesky. I'm honored to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Kirill Mardamianov. He's a professor and chair in the Department of Neuroscience at the Scripps Research Institute. Graduating summa cum laude from Samara State University in 1996 with a Bachelor's of Science degree in biochemistry, Dr. Marta Mianov has also obtained his Master of Science degree in molecular biology at Pushchino State University in 1998. He then received his PhD in molecular biology at the Institute of Protein Research of the Russian Academy of Science in 2000. Dr. Martin Mianov completed his research fellowship in ophthalmology at Harvard Medical uh, School in 2004. After this research fellowship, he started a faculty position in the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Minnesota in 2005, and then later joined the faculty positions at the Scripps Research Institute in the Department of Neuroscience. Ever since 2018 and up to now, he's serving as a chair of the department. Dr. Marta Mianova has been awarded numerous times for his distinguished research. He was awarded the Independent Science Award by the National Institute on Drug Abuse in 2009, the Kogan Award by the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology in 2004, and the Cutting Edge Base, uh, Basic Research Award by National Institute on Drug Abuse in 2015. Furthermore, he has also received wireless open leadership in pharmacology by the University of Rochester in 2016 and the John J. Abel Award by ASPT in 2018. His research focuses on regulating the mechanism of GPCR in the nerve system and neurological disease. Today, he will be speaking about the molecular organization of the photoreceptor synapse. Please welcome Dr. Martin Mianov. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for um, such a humbling introduction. Um, really happy to be here with you, with everybody um, on this morning on your, depending on where you are, afternoon. And I'm excited to share the results of our work that we've recently um, done on this, elucidating the uh, organization of the photoreceptor synapse. Um, this perhaps does not need introduction to this audience. Retina is just a beautiful, beautiful circuit. It's a light sensory structure that fascinated scientists for centuries. And here I'm just showing the drawing by famous Cajal. Uh, back in the day, we've updated the vision on the retina quite a bit over the years, which elucidate the major cell types, the connections, and the mechanisms that the neurons um, in this organ 
utilized to receive and encode light stimuli. And my the main point of me showing you this diagram is to basically say that even though that the photoreceptors are major powerhouses that generate the uh, initial light responses and encode them, it actually takes the village to produce a meaningful light response that we call vision so that the brain can actually understand and decipher the signals. And for all of us might and important things that the photoreceptors do, if they cannot transmit the information to the downstream synaptic partners, it essentially defeats the purpose. So this function of the photoreceptors, um, the encoding of the synaptic information and being able to pass the information to the downstream neurons is absolutely essential, not only for, uh, for their function, but for the vision in general. And uh, this is precisely what uh, my lab is intrigued by, and this is what we study. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit uh, in more details of how the photoreceptors uh, wire or connect to the downstream neurons. That's, again, um, a very much exquisite and specific process. Um, as you know, there are two types of the photoreceptors. If you're a corn photoreceptor, um, you have a choice. There are a couple uh, synaptic partners. Um, they can wire with the off type of the corn bipolar cells and also on uh, type of the corn bipolar cells. But if you wrote for the receptor, you have a dedicated um, synaptic partner, which is rod on bipolar cells. And the specificity of the synaptic connections and the properties of, of individual synapses is, is important because those photoreceptors extract different features. Um, and that's important for them to propagate those differences downstream in, in the circuit. So I'm going to spend a lot of time today discussing how this uh, synapse formed by rods uh, with the rod on bipolar cells is formed, organized, and what molecular elements are there. And also towards the end of my presentation, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the differences uh, with, uh, with the corn synapses and uh, share with you some of the insights that we generated studying the uh, organization of the corn synapses as well. Um, so with this, I, I just wanted to say a couple of words about how beautiful the structure is. I mean, I, there's so many reasons to appreciate this um, as a model to study. And for once, it's just, it just looks gorgeous when you look at the electron microscopy. So here I'm just showing you the image that we've generated in our lab. You can easily find the road terminals. You'd find the mitochondria lodged right in there. You can easily find the site of the uh, transmitter release by the like, electron density synaptic ribbons. Um, you'd find connections that are formed by the road on bipolar cells that deeply invaginated and position themselves right next to the site of the release. And um, as I said, the synapse is absolutely required for this catapic vision for the responses generated by road photoreceptors. It does some amazing, beautiful things in a way it functions for once it provides the nonlinear transformation uh, of the signals out and cut off the noise and also generated by the photoreceptors and also uh, extend the dynamic range. And it, it does an amazing thing that it actually flips the sign of the response from the hyperpolarizing response of the photoreceptors to the depolarizing response that the rest of the central nervous system understands as excitation. And it uses not a conventional um, ionotropic um, ambient MDA-based transmission, but also very cool GPCR metabotropic cascade for the transmission. And it's, you know, needless to say, it's a point of major regulation of visual sensitivity as well. But in addition to those basic points, um, there are also an emerging interest in setting uh, the photoreceptor synapses for the translational and clinical implications, um, because there's, there's a growing case that synaptic deficits uh, contribute uh, also to a variety of um, retina conditions and are affected by blinding disease in, in, in the reverse. And actually, now that we're thinking about the restorative strategies and uh, visual augmentation, um, photoreceptor synapses also present an attractive strategy uh, as, a, as, a, as a side of the intervention. So with this, let me give you a little bit of more of a background of how this uh, photoreceptor works. In the dark, uh, photoreceptors are um, relatively depolarized. They constantly release uh, glutamate that on the postsynaptic side, on this on bipolar cells, um, activate the G-protein coupled receptor 
whose activity is needed to keep the ion channel closed. When the light comes in and the photoreceptor is hyperpolarized, that suppresses the glutamate release and disinhibits the ion channel, allowing the depolarizing response to occur. And uh, one of the very convenient ways to assess the transduction of the synaptic of the synaptic signal is a technique that used in the field that's called electroretinography, and uh, many of you are familiar with this. It essentially um, is a field recording of the potentials from generated by the retina in response to light, and it consists of the two waves, the A wave, which reflects the hyperpolarizing response of the photoreceptors, followed by the B wave, which is essentially the depolarizing activity of the bipolar cells. And by monitoring the transition of the A wave to the B wave, you essentially can in real time, non-invasively um, record the synaptic transmission as it happens. And in pathological conditions, such as for example, congenital stationary night blindness um, that are associated with deficits in a synaptic transduction of a signal, you can still see the photoreceptor function is, is intact and the, the response um, generates the A wave, but the B wave is completely flat. That's how we know that the deficits are um, originating from the uh, synaptic uh, transduction problems. So using this um, ERG as a, as a technique uh, in human evaluated in human patients, as well as um, generating and characterizing mouse models, over the years we built quite a, an impressive um, landscape of players that are involved um, in the transduction of a signal at the synapse. And I'm gonna focus just on a few of them, just the core pathway. As I mentioned, the, it's driven by the metabotropic GPCR cascade. The principal receptor here is MGLOR6 that activates the GPRO and GO that keeps the affected channel, ion channel trypan one closed. And this cascade is um, found in a perfect alignment with the presynaptic site of the photoreceptors where the neurotransmitter is released and the release is controlled by the calcium channel. Um, CAF 1.4 and Chris, um, Chris's group's done some of the seminal work uh, identifying the mechanism for the calcium channel regulation that contributes to the synaptic transmission and um, the regulation of visual sensitivity. But one of the interesting questions that we've um, thought when we, we saw such a regulation, well, uh, it's easy to appreciate such a beautiful alignment, right? And how would the postsynaptic elements would be found in a position exactly where the transmitter release is happening was um, very interesting to us. So basically, in other words, if you are, if you, if you running, um, let's say like if you are attempting a stunt and you want to jump off the building and you want to make sure that somebody is there at the bottom with the safety nets and everything to catch you. So if the photoreceptor releases the transmitter, you need to be sure that the relevant one cascade to interpret the changes is going to be there. So to address this question, we've um, actually used a technique that I'm going to show you quite a bit of, uh, which is just a biochemical purification uh, protein complexes, uh, identification of the binding partners. So in this particular case, we've generated the antibodies for the key um, receptor, the MGLOR6, um, immunoprecipitated from the retina, and identifying the binding partners by mass spec. And out came a few um, candidate uh, proteins. Uh, the top one was, of course, MGLOR6 itself. And the second best hit that we identified um, years ago was the protein called ELFN1, or extracellular leucine rich fiber uh, domain containing protein 1. Um, it's got a pretty significant real estate outside of the cell, as would be predicted. We've confirmed that elephant one directly interacts with uh, MGLOR6 by biochemical pull down assays with purified proteins. And you can see that the binding is, is actually pretty robust. We've generated the antibodies uh, against elephant one, found that it's a synaptic protein localized to the photoreceptor synapses in nice opposition to the sites of the release that are marked here by the rebuy, this electron dense. Um, component that orchestrates the synaptic release and uh, very nicely aligned with MGLOR6. And it is not really expressed in a bipolar cells where MGLOR6 is present, but instead it is specifically expressed in the raw photoreceptors and not in cones. And uh, in order uh, for this to bind to the MGLOR6 that way, 
it would have to happen in a transsynaptic manner. So we've knocked out elephant one in mice, and um, the phenotype is depicted in those uh, immunohistochemistry images. Um, you can usually find the photoreceptor synapses, the rod synapses, but the speckles, the synaptic puncta that are located in the outer plexiform layer, and you can identify the cone synapses in a lower sublamina of the outer plexiform layer where they are clustered uh, together. In elephant one knockouts, we still see MGLOR6 present in the cone synapses, but it is completely devoid from rods, uh, from rod synapse. So it essentially means that knocking out elephant one in the photoreceptors disrupts the postsynaptic localization of the receptor for the glutamate in, in bipolar cells. We further found that uh, elephant one knockout is accompanied by uh, lack of the synaptic physical synaptic connectivity of the uh, rod on bipolar cells with the um, with the rod terminals. Um, I've showed you this picture before. I'm labeling different elements here. In the wild types, you can see deeply invaginating rod um, dendrites and the terminal elephant one knockout. The side of the release is there. Even the horizontal cells are there, but the rod on bipolar cells can no longer invaginate within, the, within and position themselves right next to the side of the release. And this is not a problem in cone photoreceptors. Elephant one is not expressed in cones, at least that's what we thought at the time. And um, it, it's still nicely positioned uh, right next to the site in, in those other receptors. Uh, we've evaluated the, the mice using the ERGs. And what we found is that knockout of elephant one completely prevents the transduction of the raw generated signal. So here's a B wave and a wild type animals and absolute flat line and elephant one knockouts. And when we go to the patopic, uh, lights of the uh, stimulation and probe what happens in the corn or the transaction of the corn signals, those happen to be completely intact and even in the absence of elephant one knockout. So the synaptic regulator is important for the transduction of rod generated signals. Um, and more recently, we were asked a bit of our opposite question, a converse question, and this is a part of the unpublished data, whether we can rescue those synaptic deficits in a transduction in adults animals. So this was in a collaboration with um, Bill Houseworth, who's who helped us uh, generate the uh, virus, expressing the Cree and the Shannon boy uh, with the Cree recombinase under the control of the uh, road specific promoter. Uh, we've actually generated the conditional rescue knockout line of elephant one that lack elephant uh, one from birth. But um, the quoting region of this is um, flanked with lock P sites. When the Cre recombinase is delivered to the site, um, it can recombine back into the normal copy. And what we found, lo and behold, in this adult animals that were not able to pass the road signals uh, from birth, the infection of the stressiness with AAV could restore um, the Amglor 6 synaptic puncta. And when evaluated by the ARG, we found that the, um, those mice regained the B wave. So we restore not only the synaptic connectivity, but also the functional propagation of the signal, which gives us hope that the synaptic deficits can actually be restored post-developmentally. So with this, um, the model that we have is that the postsynaptic cascade in the bipolar cells is actually anchored through the transsynaptic mechanism that involves the rod specific um, element, the elephant one, that position itself right where the neurotransmitter release is happening. So the question becomes, how does it know whether the transmitter, where the transmitter release is happening? So we went back to the proteomic results of that proteomic screen and found that um, uh, there's an interesting element there somewhere down towards the middle of the list. And this element is called alpha-2 delta-4, which is typically described as the auxiliary subunit of the calcium channel, which is also shown to have synaptogenic activity in a variety of uh, model systems. So we got intrigued by this identification and decided to explore this further. So uh, one of the things that we did, we've generated the knockout of um, eliminated alpha to delta four in the retina. You can see that it's a complete null. And um, 
it's normally present at the synapses where you'd expect it should be in a knockout, it is absolutely absent. And what's interesting is that in, in this alpha to delta four knockout, we see a significant perturbation of the synaptic organization. So first of all, the MGLUR6 is completely gone from the rod synapsis, and it's still, even though that's still present in the colon synapsis, um, TRIPM1 synaptic localization in rods is also perturbed, but importantly, we no longer find elephant one should be synaptically localized. So the positioning of elephant one in rods must require the uh, presence of alpha two delta four subunit. So uh, we've also evaluated uh, the phenotype morphologically, and unlike elephant one, um, knockout, the phenotype associated with alpha 2 delta 4, knockout is more severe, it's more dramatic. We can find only the, re the remaining uh, portions of the road terminals and they don't really have any intact synapses or the contacts with the bipolar cells. Cone pedicles are there, we can identify them. Uh, we can also identify uh, the contacts with the cone and bipolar cells and off bipolar cells, but they also kind of look um, abnormal. But the important part is that the cone synapses are there. Um, we've also looked in collaboration with uh, Sam Sampa's group. We looked at the retina um, responses, uh, synaptic transduction events by single cell recordings from various types of the bipolar cells. Uh, predictably, we detect complete loss of the transduction of the road signals to the road on bipolar cells. And uh, even though the signaling uh, synaptic transmission should be off and on uh, quant bipolar cells is perturbed, we can still find that the synaptic transmission is possible um, in the quant synapses. So with this, we can update the scheme somewhat that the positioning of elephant one in the uh, road terminals requires um, association with the alpha two delta four subunits, whether that's permanent or transient association is an open question, which itself latches on onto the calcium channel, which essentially is an entity that knows where the release of the transmitter is, is, is going to be. So um, with this scheme, let me just pause uh, for a while and take a slight turn and bring this uh, story just for a moment on the intracellular side of the on bipolar cascade and deal with the question of how the signal is going to be initiated. One of the funny things that I mentioned already a couple of times, this is a sign inverting synapse, meaning that in order to propagate the signal, to generate signal on all bipolar cells, you actually need to deactivate the cascade to allow the trip channel to open. And this deactivation cannot occur um, unless the G protein gets deactivated. Well, guess what? The G proteins take a long time to deactivate and it's not consistent with the time frame of the light response. So this process must be assisted. And uh, what we know about the assistance in, in this process is that it requires the contribution of the regulators of G protein signal, which are specific proteins that deactivate the response. So a few years ago, we found a pair of our GS proteins that uh, play this role in the photoreceptor synapse on the bipolar cells, and that's RGS7 and RGS11. If you knock out this pair of RGSs, you have a very characteristic no B wave phenotype, meaning that the photoreceptors still generate the signal, but then um, you fail to uh, generate the uh, postsynaptic response. So, knowing that RGS7 and 11 um, contribute to essential components of this cascade, essentially, um, the question comes up of how does the RGS protein now know where it should be if the system is so well aligned and it requires association with the photoreceptor proteins across the synapse? So we've uh, started asking this question. And again, we've done what we do best. We've conducted the biochemical purification followed by the mass spectrometric uh, analysis. And out of this came, in this, time, in this time, we've purified RGS7 protein. We've done it both in the brain and in the retina. And out of this came um, unusual proteins. Out of this, we, we found the typical binding partner for RGS7 uh, and 11, which is G-beta-5. And also this unusual looking GPCR-like molecule that um, 
field refers to them as orphan receptors, meaning that they look like GPCRs, but we really have no idea what the ligands are and what the biology, what the signaling mechanisms. But what we found is that they nicely bind to the RGS protein. Uh, proteins. And we found two of those things. Um, it seems like, like the brain specific orphan receptor that associates with RGS7 is GPR158, and the retina specific um, ortholog is GPR179. So, in collaboration with Ron Gregg's group, uh, we've um, looked at the localization of um, both RGSs and GPR179 in the retinas. And sure enough, it is exactly where you expect it to be in the photoreceptor synapses. If you eliminate GPR-179 strikingly, RGS-7 can no longer localize to the synapses. So you need GPR-179, this orphan GPCR-like molecule, to position RGS-7 complex at the synapses where it supposedly does its job in deactivating cascade and allowing the synaptic response to happen. Well, I, I mean, it never ends, right? So now that we know that GPR-179 is at the synapse, and we know that the position of MGOR6 requires transsynaptic interaction, the natural question becomes, well, is the position of GPR-179 RGS complex likewise requires some sort of a transsynaptic interactions? So again, we went back and did the... Um, biochemical purification mass spec. And this time we've um, taken the actidamine, the extracellular portion of GPR-179 and combine it with the lysates of the cells and look at what binds to the extracellular portion of this orphan receptor. And the results were kind of unsatisfying for a while. We were getting a lot of proteins and we couldn't really make sense of uh, out of like what those proteins are. Um, until one day, we've actually annotated uh, those proteins in terms of the biology and found that at least half of them belong to the same class of heparin sulfate proteoglycans. And out of this list, once we realized this, one of them stood up um, in particular, even though that's low confident, well, low in terms of like our ability to detect it, um, but it was a fairly confident interaction. And there's a protein that's called Picaturian, the Echahisa Furukata's group, a few years ago, described as the key organizer of the photoreceptor synapses. We've confirmed that GPR-179 binds um, with uh, picaturin by, in IP experiments, so looking by the Western blots in both forward and reverse um, direction. So it's right where it's supposed to be. And what picaturin is, it's actually described uh, by Furukawa group again as a ligand for the dystroglycan dystrophin complex and that involves the adaptive protein dystroglycan and a cytoplasmic um, um, cytoskeleton associated protein in the photoreceptors called dystrophin. And um, also for recovery's group uh, described that knockout of both picaturin and dystroglycan components have a very characteristic effects on the synaptic transmission, which accompanies you know, the slowing of the B wave generation, which you would expect if the RGS system is affected. And so we got really interested in this. So, and what we did, we've got a hold of, um, of a whole bunch of knockouts. I'm showing just the Picaturian and dystrophin loss of function mutants, but we've also done in collaboration with the recovers group of um, the alpha dystrophic lichen knockout as well. And invariably, when you look at those knockout models, you see uh, one thing abundantly clear is that uh, the GPR-179 synaptic levels appear to be substantially downregulated. You can see that MGLOR6 um, synaptic accumulation is perfectly fine. And say Pikachu in knockout, and but GPR 179 is no longer uh, clustered. Actually, it is, but like much less so. In a dystrophin loss of function, sorry, I'm switching the colors here, but it's essentially the same picture. GPR 179 is markedly downregulated, but MGLOR6 is not affected. So, um, what we believe is happening is that GPR 179 is also anchored across the synapse through the interaction with the Picaturin. And that in turn anchors to the dystroglycan complex that sets up the second transsynaptic channel that now brings the RGS proteins to ensure the timely opening of the trip channel.
All right, so I'm flipping to the next slide to hopefully cover the next topic. And not a lot of change uh, is changing, but if you uh, if, if you pay attention to what is changing, I'm actually changing the rod for the receptor for the cone for the receptor, okay? So the cone synapses have many of the same components that rod synapses, but there are some differences. And one of the key differences is that I spent, you know, half of my talk talking about how important elephant one is, well, but it is a rod specific molecule. So what is ensures the transsynaptic alignment of Mglora6 and a cascade in a consynapsis it has been a puzzle to us. So one of the first things that we asked is whether in principle, this mechanisms rely on elephant one like mechanism. So in order to address this, again, we've collaborated with Bill Houseworth, uh, Shannon Boy, um, who generated uh, generated the viruses uh, containing AVs that express elephant one under the control this time of the corn specific promoter. So what we do here, we, we inject those viruses in a wild type retinas uh, that gets to express elephant one in cones that normally we cannot detect it there and ask the question whether it will have any effect um, on the Anglora 6 uh, localization. And yes, it does. When we all express elephant one in the cones, you see upregulation of MGR6 recruitment. So that told us that in principle, this mechanism that operates on the cones has to be similar to the rods and rely on some sort of an elephant one like type of the molecule. So we went looking. So we went looking for such molecule, and um, we took advantage this time um, of the cone dominant species, retinas from the condominant species. And that was in a collaboration with Wei Li at NIH and David Fitzpatrick across the, um, across the road, uh, who generously supplied us with a ground squirrel in a tree shrew retinas. And we've essentially generated the antibodies against Amgora 6 uh, that recognize this condominant uh, species, uh, types of the receptors, uh, pulled it down, my spec identified, and we started seeing something that we did not see before. In addition to elephant one, we started picking up another protein, uh, which in retrospect is kind of intuitive. It was called elephant chew. Well, we've generated the antibodies against elephant chew. It was beautifully corn specific. It's on a corn synapsis now. Um, aligns with the corn arresting, with the sites of the release nicely overlaps with Amgora 6. So it is a perfect candidate. We thought we got it. We knocked out elephant chew in mice, complete null. There's absolutely no phenotype. The scatopic uh, transduction is not, synaptic transmission is not perturbed. The corn driven photopic morphology looks great. Amgora 6 is where it's supposed to be. This mice have no phenotype. And yet elephant two is a synapse specific, corn specific molecule. So, and then, and then something happened. When we started looking carefully in, and characterize this elephant two knockout retinas, one of the things that we noticed is actually elephant one started showing up at those corn synapses once you knock out elephant two. We've characterized in development what happens and the long story short, I don't have time to show all of the data. Essentially, early on in the development, and we're looking here at the corn synaptic content, elephant one is present in those synapses, and then it gets markedly downregulated as the retina is mature. And in contrast, um, elephant two appears to be constant and gets upregulated somewhat. But when you knock out elephant two, Elephant one, instead of being downregulated, now takes over and, uh, and gets a boost. So we have a classical case for the compensation uh, between the two proteins. So what it meant is that the models would have to be more complex in order to address the issue of a synaptic connectivity and uh, localization of MGOR6. So what we did, um, what we had to do is to develop elephant one conditional mice, elephant one flux. We bred them with elephant two global knockouts. And then we further bred this line with the Cree driver line uh, that is active in the photoreceptors. And we use PCDH21 Cree. Now we have this uh, constitutive double knockout, uh, conditional double knockout line. And lo and behold, I wouldn't be telling you the story if that was not the phenotype, 
we see a complete loss of the B wave and the stable knockout that is no longer no no different than triple one knockout, and um, essentially elephant one is is gone and elephant two is gone from the cone synapses and MGOR6 is completely absent as well. Um, so that basically, uh, and then we looked at the uh, organization of the uh, synaptic connections of the cones and in contrast to the rods, we actually don't see the um, synaptic, uh, the deficits in a physical establishment of the contacts. We can still find the um, contacts formed um, by on the cone on bipolar cells with a cone pedicle. So this is a bit of a, diff a difference here. The cone synapse appears to be anatomically intact. So the model for what's responsible for um, functional wiring of the cone synapses is the following early on in the development. Um, the elephant one is active and then this molecule um, gets switched over to an adult stage to elephant two that is, is, is required or given the positioning of MGOR6 across the synaptic cleft. So um, just in a couple um, minutes and a few minutes that I have left, I, I just wanna discuss a bit of our philosophy here. So, because basic science is what drives our efforts. We really get excited about those issues, but um, one can ask the question, what is there any sort of practical implications for um, for those molecules and the mechanisms that we um, discover, and we believe so. We believe that there is some use uh, for those synaptogenic molecules in in the degenerate in, in, in the setting of retina degeneration. So, for one of the ideas, and perhaps introduce this in degenerating retina, she compensate for the loss of the photoreceptors by augments and the synaptic gain. And nowadays there's a lot of effort also in uh, coming up with the uh, artificial prosthetics um, and also stem cell based therapies um, that uh, provide the new light sensory modality in the retina. And the question invariably comes up, well, you will probably have to wire them in an appropriate way so that the information is transmitted in, in a way that the brain is gonna understand as vision and perhaps um, supplementing those synaptogenic molecules and that are present in the rodent cone photoreceptors of like elephants would be um, important for ensuring that um, this wiring happens um, according to appropriate rules. Um, but perhaps even broader um, implications is that um, our understanding of how brain um, wires in general, because I just talked about the uh, retina as a model system with a defined set of uh, five types of different neurons and two types of the photoreceptors. But if you go in a brain, you, you have like billions of neurons and they make trillions of connections. And the model that um, has been has gained quite a bit of attraction is that the wiring and the synaptic establishment of the synaptic connectivity and the spe specifying those uh, connections functionally requires some sort of our molecularly acting adapters. So think about it as, as socket versus plug matching. You have to have a specific uh, connections between the neuronal types in order to define them. And we believe that there is a quite, um, this, this, this would be important for, um, for the meaningful information processing in the brain and perhaps uh, this deficits in miswiring uh, be some um, underlying causes behind your psychiatric process. And we believe that uh, molecules like elephant one and elephant two uh, that we identified in the retina would have direct relevance to understanding those issues. And I'm gonna show you some of the evidence uh, for, uh, for that, for and the, some of the grounds for me saying this. We've actually found that elephant two is very nicely expressed in the brain as well. And um, we've also characterized the phenotype of um, elephant two loss in the brain. And uh, what we see there is loss of the glutamate receptors that are homologous and belong to the same group as MGLUR6 in the retina. Those are so-called group three MGLURs that MGLUR6 is not in the brain, but its cousins are. It's MGLUR4, 7, and 8. And elephant two knockouts, we see a significant down regulation of all of us three 
receptors across the brain. We've actually looked at the consequences on a synaptic transmission, and the phenotype is actually pretty remarkable. So remember that uh, photoreceptor synapse is inverted. So everything is backwards in the photoreceptor synapse in the central nervous system. Those MGLORs are usually presynaptic and they control the release of the neurotransmitter. So they serve as the autoreceptors, essentially limit the extent of the glutamate being released as the um, excitation increases. So the glutamate, when it reaches a certain volume, is going to bind to the cloud group three MGLORs and they're going to inhibit uh, further release. So they constrain the neurotransmitter signaling. And elephant shoe interacts with those MGORs across the synapse. They position them there so that they can control the volume. And if you knock out elephant shoe in the brain, you see actually massive augmentation of the postsynaptic potentials here because, well, the MGOR, uh, group three MGORs are no longer there. So there's nothing to constrain the release of glutamate. And needless to say, the SMIs display a range of the neuropsychiatric manifestations that would expect from the unconstrained glutamatergic signaling, hyperactivity, the SMIs develop seizures, they have generalized anxiety as well. And we believe that this is also happening in humans. Um, there's been studies and there are more of this is coming along the lines um, that there are actually mutations present in the human populations that occur in both elephant one and elephant two that um, predispose uh, people to a variety of the conditions, including seizures. So we think we're just scratching the tip of an iceberg with, uh, with this research. But with this, I'm, I'm going to stop here and thank the people who's done the work. It's essentially uh, Team Retina in my lab, Yan Cao, Cesar Alanzi, Yuchen Wan, Henry Dunn, helped with the signaling, Maria Dao's done behavior, Stefano Zuko is an electrophysiologist who's characterized the synaptic responses. Half of those people already moved on to greener pastures. They have the independent faculty positions and developing these lines further. Uh, I've enjoyed tremendous collaboration with Sam Sampa, who is now at UCLA, um, Whaley, Johan Palberg at NIH, and um, all of the viral, viral work was done in collaboration with Bill Houseworth and Shannon Boy. And I'm really thankful to the funding that we enjoyed over the years, getting it from the National Eye Institute. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kirill. What a beautiful biochemistry. Not too many people can do such a fantastic work. Uh, and uh, it kind of... Uh, I would say old uh, technology with beautiful new applications and, and when it's well done, it's really quite uh, informative. So I, let me start very quickly as people are gathering their thoughts and, and uh, dropping the a note in the chat that they have a question. Um, I have a question that I perhaps should know, but I don't remember. With aging mice, uh, for those uh, genetic models, they do not have a B wave. Uh, is there a photoreceptor degeneration uh, at the end, you know, like one year old and older mice? It depends on the model, right? So like with, with, with aging, what happens is that it's actually one of the good models for looking at the synaptic deficiencies, right? So the photoreceptors are, what they do, they retract the terminal. I see. They, the axons get like, I, I think eventually, yeah, the photoreceptors die, but before that happens, um, there are some synaptic anomalies and they retract the terminals. And that uh, triggers massive uh, sort of a rewiring of the circuit. And uh, also the bipolar cells sense this and send the projections in outer, um, in, in, in those, so like it's, it's outer nuclear layer, layers where things end up um, being rewired. Uh, so we've, we're actually looking into the role that elephant, you know, proteins play in this process as well in those models. I see. So, so really retina is like that sponge all connected. If even you remove one element, it's not good for the entire structure, right? Yeah. Well, also metabolic is another sort of, it's, it's a metabolic deficit. So LKB1 um, sort of knockout comes to mind. Um, and it's a similar process. You, you have some synaptic deficits and a retraction of the photoreceptor uh, connection. So 
when things are not quite happy, maybe not to the extent that you die right away, but you know, when just kind of first phases of being unhappy, synaptic remodeling does happen. Henry. Hi, really nice talk, uh, Kirill. I'm a postdoc at um, Chris Balser's group, and I, I might have missed this, but um, at what age was this LFN1 rescue experiment done? And a follow-up question would be like, what is your thought, like how well this synaptic plasticity translates from mouse to human? So at least like my view, I kind of feel that mouse is kind of likely more easier in a sense, like mm. it might be a more plastic um, organist to begin with. So do, how, like, do you have any view, like how well it would translate to, to primates? Right, yeah, happy to talk about it. So the first question is at which age, it's fully developed uh, retinas. We looked at the two month old mice. So they're basically fully mature retinas when the development is, is, is over. Um, and in terms of human connection, I mean, I, I can only speculate. I mean, we don't study humans in the lab. It's for obvious reasons. The uh, manipulations are way more difficult. I do not believe um, that clinical researchers look that much into this whole elephant one sort of complexes um, and what happens and say aging or retina sort of uh, dysfunctions, degeneration models. Um, it, it's... It's kind of new, so I'm hoping that there's going to be more interest in looking at a variety of sort of diseases and just even natural um, sort of human um, setting. I have nothing meaningful to say about humans, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough, tough question. Thank you. Yeah. Philip. Hi, Kirill. Uh, nice to see you um, again. And uh, it was it was a really fantastic talk. It's great work. Um, my my question is, uh, and I may have missed it, but in, I was wondering in the Picaturin, whenever you get rid of Picaturin, you know, you showed that the GPR um, 179 localization is lost. Does the, if you look at just the total protein, or I don't know if it's even possible to do this, that, d does the total protein go down or do you think that it's just sort of mislocalized sort of everywhere along the cell membrane? And then the follow-up to that would be if you could overexpress that picature in, in like a ganglion cell, for example, do you think you would shift it and have a localization like on the other side of the bipolar cell? Yeah, so the first issue is um, it's, it's a bit harder to disentangle in the field in general um, because a lot of those knockouts, you knock out the partner and then whatever is bound to this is also destabilized post-translationally. So you do, the field, we've described, the whole field described a whole bunch of like effects that are expression sort of related also. And we believe that's like post-translational, uh, post, um, but you can overcome this, right? You can basically like crank up again and say like whatever is left is that still localized. So uh, we like addressing those issues separately. So like, is there an effect on expression? But like on top of us, I, are there like deficits in a localization, right? So, uh, so we kind of dissociate those effects on expression from uh, from a localization. I, I, I don't think I, I don't believe we looked in the expression of one seventy nine in Pikachu in Nakat um, uh, ever explicitly. I need to go back and check. Um, but we believe it's mainly localization issues. Um, and the second would be the second question that you asked, what would happen if you start going instead of knocking out things, if you start running the gain of function things, we've only done this with elephant one and the cones as I've shown, right? Presumably those expression of those molecules can form sort of, um, ectopic synaptogenic, we may have ectopic synaptogenic activity as well. Uh, we have not really explored them that much, just basically driving an unnatural cell type and see whether it can rewire it com in a completely weird and uh, not normal way, right? That is what I meant when I was like thinking about possibly using this molecules uh, when trying to sort of wire the sort of light sensitive cells or prosthetics. And that would be a really fun thing to do, to take those different factors and like all express them and the newly light sensitive cells and see how they're gonna like integrate in the circuit. 
Right. Yeah. It just, it just comes from the question of, you know, how much of this protein localization is, is from some other factor that's driving it to one end of the cell versus the other, or if it's just, you know, mainly just an affinity, it finds its binding partner and then it just sticks there. It was kind of. So elephant like, one, for example, is targeted to the synapse independently from MGLUR6, from the transsynaptic partner. So like if you knock out elephant one, MGLUR6 doesn't go. But like if you knock out MGLUR6, elephant one is still at the synapse. So in that case, it's unidirectional. Other components um, we haven't explored, you know, in a, in a great detail. What if you knock out now 179 with dystroglycan complex is not going to be perturbed, I'm guessing, because it's kind of a logic complex associated with the matrix, but we don't know for sure. So it would be a combination of scenarios. Sometimes it's bidirectional. You kind of need both a mutual sort of requirement for both of the components across the synapse. Sometimes it's unidirectional. There's a hierarchy. But, but that is a really interesting question, you know, how you organize that uh, in, in kind of cell biological question. How do you put them together and holding together? Well, people who studied, people who studied the sort of postsynaptic densities has been grappling with us like yeah, <laughs> for a very long time, right? I mean, they're all of us network of players and then like they all kind of have to come together and they're codependent and I, there's some central organizers, but you know, that's fine. If you lose the central organizer, nothing else is organized. I, I think it's a, it's a really fascinating question in biology in general. Like, how do you like assemble a lot of things from like a whole bunch of pieces and they have to be present almost like simultaneously. Okay, let's move to a back one. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, good morning. My question is, uh, if you LFF192 double knockout, do you see any video that double knockout? Elephant one, elephant two, double knockout, the straight out double knockout. Yes. Uh, this guy, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, sorry, I, mean, I, I I skipped this a little bit. Obviously, that's one of the first thing I would do, but this mice die. Oh. Uh, so that's why we went into the conditional, because, I mean, you can imagine, you know, what goes on in the brain with unconstrained glutamatergic signaling. Like conditional knockout, like particular cone photoreceptor cells are... So that's why we went for the conditional in a photoreceptor specific fashion. Okay. This way we were able to avoid the lethality issue. Thank you. All right, the next will be Chris Sander. Hi, Professor, uh, great talk. Um, I was wondering actually related to the thing that we had just been talking about before Bagot's question. Um, if groups that are focusing on transplantation uh, in the retina uh, would seemingly have a problem with the sort of developmental questions that you guys were just talking about with elephant one, getting that signaling right uh, in order to make those connections correctly. And if you can see like, it, or maybe you're already collaborating with people um, in that vein or something like that, but like advice that you'd have on those sorts of projects. How to... I, yeah, so we're not really pursuing it, you know, in, oh. in my lab, um, we're just for the basic sort of biology parts, but I think it'd be just fun to try. Like, I don't really have a specific advice other than just like trying to express those things and seeing whether uh, there's going to be a sort of benefit to the augmenting the synaptic wire in a functional state or sort of connectivity in general. Um, I'm just kind of putting it out there as sort of open-ended hypothesis and we haven't really something that we haven't really done and don't have any immediate plans of doing. It would be great if uh, people who study and have this to generate uh, models and also who study the gene therapy or all of us like transplantation experiments to just kind of try this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move to Professor Jim. Hi, Kirill. Uh, do, you, do you think Jim. the... Uh, do you think the GPR-179 might have a uh, small molecule ligand or is it just play that tethering role? Both 179 and 158. Yeah, it's been, it's been tough. We, we've been on a search for ligands, right? Because this is the number one question when you say orphan receptor. Um, this is the number one question. Is there a ligand? Um, it's small molecule, I'm not so sure. 
but mm -hmm. I'll say that there's a whole class of um, G protein coupled receptors that are called adhesion GPCRs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, right, right? For a very long time, you know, Sudhoff and, and others studied them as just synaptic organizers. And then a few years ago only, they realized, oh, yeah, they're actually GPCRs. <laughs> and so those are ancient receptors. And actually, this could be one of those, yeah. right? This could be one of the sort of receptors that maybe trigger it or change the conformation to initiate some signal and events in response to association with matrix and you know some other protein, protein interactions. Hard to say. And what about the G part of the GPCR? Yeah, so we don't have any evidence that it activates the G proteins. We looked hard, you know, for both 158, 179. You pair them with all of us different. They just don't like. We actually just got the structure of 158, um, the cryo M structure. Uh, it sits with RGS, and RGS completely occludes the binds in sight for the G alpha. So it's just like a resin, basically. When this thing is there, there's no way G alpha can come in. So why is it? But it's got conserved elements. This DRY and XPX, all of us motifs are there. So they conserved and they're present. So like, I, can it activate G-proteins at some point? Maybe, but not when RGS is bound. Yeah, right. All right, any other question? Yeah, Kirill. Yeah, right. Hey, how are you doing? Good, good. Um, so it's kind of a chicken and egg question, right? I mean, what do you think? So, so photoreceptors get stressed by a whatever mechanism. Mm -hmm. And, and then uh, we start seeing these synaptic alterations and then, you know, bipolar cell, broad bipolar cell synapse alterations. Um, is, is that because of the changes in the synapse from the photoreceptor side or what, I mean, what, where do you think that cascade starts? Yeah, I mean, you 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 said it yourself, right? When the photoreceptors get stressed and they start doing something, right? <laughs> so that, you know, I want to think that it is originating in the photoreceptors, right? The synaptic, but like you can't be sure, right? Because photoreceptors, it's easy to stress them. It's almost like you, you breathe wrong or you do anything and then it's just like, okay, they give up, right? Uh, such fragile cells with like lots of challenges and issues. Um, perhaps it's a photoreceptor sort of specific thing. Maybe not to say that this cannot be triggered by sort of postsynaptic changes. Maybe some of it is also postsynaptic. Uh, but the photoreceptors just position nicely, like to initiate a yeah, lot yeah, of yeah. things. Yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm I'm intrigued by this by this by this balance issue between excitation and inhibition. You know, because I mean, we, we certainly know. I mean, I mean, the thing that's sort of blown my mind from the epilepsy literature is that. You know, people people talk about this, but but nobody's really done that work, right? To 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 look at the balance and, and how that alter alters uh, circuitry, um, and in in great models like hippocampus. So so it just seems like the retina is such an ideal model for this. Yeah, um, I'll I'll make a philosophical comment as well. So I think from the uh, from the way the nervous system works, it doesn't really matter. It's not it's not a cell autonomous phenomenon. Exactly. It's actually like network exactly. it's connections that is important, and not really individual neurons. Yeah. So from that perspective, it's almost like a mute point. Like where is it initiated? You know what happens with the information transfer between those two points is 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 what's important. This, this, this is actually why, why we've been pushing so hard lately for, for retina as a model to sort of understand general CNS principles, uh, mm -hmm. because we're seeing a lot of the same pathologies in retina, even down to proteinopathies that, that, um, that you see in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Right. Um, no, yeah. no, the work that you're doing is so cool here. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a note, I'll follow up. That'd be great, okay. I have, I have many more questions. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move to uh, Professor Yuan Yuan Chen. Uh, hi, Creel. Really nice talk. And I was uh, wondering what uh, GPR 179 was doing for a while until I catch up your publication because I found the uh, RNA seq, it's a highly expressed uh, GPR. And so my question is 
due to its uh, high expression level, do you think there should be a differentiation between on and off bipolar cells uh, connecting to photoreceptor? Uh, differentiation no. in a sense, um, whether yeah, it would well, have like a differential oh. role in connections? Yes, well, or there are other connection molecules or it's- Oh, there are likely others as well. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that this is so simple. It, it is expressed in both rodent cone, uh, you know, synapses, right? So like you look at GPR-179, you have no B wave. So it affects both of the synapses and RGSs are needed for both of the synapses. There are some molecules that we find in so that specify functionally the synapses. And a good example of this is, I didn't have time to talk about l -RIT one um, There's a whole family of the cell adhesion molecules that are called l -RITs. And l -RIT one uh, us and the four recovers group independently found this. It's specifically in a, it's called synapse enriched. And that dictates the functional uh, properties of the cone synapses. There's also LRE3, which is more mysterious. It is also mutated in, human, in humans with a congenital station 9 blindness. And that operates in both rota and cone synapses. And if you knock it out, there's no B wave again in, in both of them. So there's current belief from um, Ron Gregg's group that it likely anchors the third point, right? It's Nictalopin trip channel. Because trip channel also needs to position itself in the, in the, in the synaptic clock. So maybe there's like LR3 orchestrates the third transsynaptic breach. And there are likely all sorts of modifiers that exist at those synapses and rods and cones that kind of do things to sort of adjust the, the properties. All right, let's move to Sumita. Hi, hi, Doctor. Thank you for the nice talk. My question is, uh, just like ELF and ELF two dependent on delta two gamma, uh, delta two gamma, is ELF and one also dependent on that? On on which one, uh, elephant? Uh, yeah, no. uh, the, oh, like uh, alpha two delta. We have not uh, we have not looked specifically at the interaction between alpha two delta and elephant two, but we're I assume there's going to be less of a dependence, right? Because the quant synapses are actually less perturbed. The morphology is, is certainly um, abnormal, but in alpha to delta four knockouts, the, um, the transmission is there and the connectivity in principle is there. So, and the quants are, quants and Quant synapse in general starts looking more like CNS synapse already, right? So things are getting more complicated. It's not just one type of the bipolar connects, but there's a second, there's a classical sort of K8 empire based synapse that's there. Um, my bet is that it's going to be more than alpha to delta four. My bet is that there's going to be al other alpha to delta subunits because that system is also redundant in the quant synapses. Okay, thank you. Kira, thank you so much. We had a wonderful presentation and great questions. And before we move on to our final comments that uh, will be given by the man who never lost work, uh, my brother Swarup. Uh, uh, yes, yes, that's true. If I could ask uh, Brian uh, to stay on and Henry uh, for a little while after the... Um, very thoughtful and insightful comments from Anand. All right. And then, the, and then Anna, you you look beautiful when you are uh, commenting, but it would be nice to have a voice as well. You're muted. Okay, <laughs> I have to unmute. All right. So I have been saying something that's good that you didn't hear. <laughs> uh, Kirill, um, so. I, I, as always, I, I have heard you a bunch of times and I each time I learned something that I missed last time, you know, so, uh, but what has been bothering me um, for a while uh, working on uh, photoreceptors has been that, you know, when you start analyzing the RNA-seq data uh, from purified rods or cones and you start seeing um, what kind of genes are there, uh, and what may be specific or non-specific, you, you realize that there are literally dozens, if not hundreds, dozens of uh, receptor uh, genes 
that are expressed in these cells, uh, both in rods and cones specifically. So if you, uh, for example, in our kids, if you knock out NRL, you see really cone genes and other cone genes and many receptor GPCR kinds that are, have not been analyzed yet. So what we tried to do is we thought, okay, we will take um, some of these receptors and we'll knock them out. And we did that for some atypical thing. And it so happens they're expressed at very high levels. You could see them both RNA and protein level. You knock them out, nothing happens, at least to, at least at the level of um, uh, sort of uh, studies, uh, whether you do ERG or degeneration or anything unless you go really deeper to try to sort of understand what, do, do, do you think these cells express all sorts of genes which have no function that just happen to be there? Or you think we are missing something that maybe we are missing how to analyze what these genes are doing. And maybe, do you have some ideas how you will sort of go about uh, looking at um, some of the stuff? I, I, I hate to believe that nature would do anything which is wasteful, that will be expressing yeah. all these things that are out yeah. there. But I don't know yeah, what to do about them. Yeah, so there are like a couple levels to this, like uh, to this answer to this question. So the example that I spent some time talking about is elephant chew. This is one of them. We've actually um, given up on this initially. We've knocked it out and there's absolutely no phenotype. So we were like, put down and like, what's the, it's, it's nice that it's specific and it cons, but it's like, and it took us a while to realize this whole sort of redundancy situation, right? Um, and again, talking about the transcription, it, it happens at the transcriptional level that you have an upregulation of another molecule once you knock out your target. So I think this loss of function approaches, you know, for as much as I love them, they're also significant caveats because you perturb the whole system. And if the system is not, the system is resilient in many cases, right? So all of us compensatory influences, like all of us, so like if you don't see something in the loss of function that you predicted to see, it may not necessarily mean that you, you know, there's no phenotype. Perhaps like conditional knockouts and then knocking out things after they reach sort of maturity is the way it should go. Over Russian. So that's one level of, of the answer um, to this. But uh, the second level could be that, I mean, we just don't know what process they are involved in. It's exactly like you're saying. So we assume that it's going to be important for the synaptic transmission functional connection, but maybe it's like something else. Yeah, and many times right? it's very hard to find what the cognate uh, or, or, or what the redundant protein will be because uh, many of them do not seem to have any obvious homologs. In your case with ELFN1 and 2, you could argue, or in some other cases, one can say, oh, we have done some of these, which are really, I, I couldn't imagine what would compensate for their loss of function. So, so we are at a loss at times. Anyway, great. But how, have you ever, so Anand, I have another sort of question related to this, but in those cases, when you knock something out and you don't see the phenotype, have you ever done the RNA seq to see what now the profile is like? Yes, we have. Be and you see a lot of different kinds of genes coming up. It doesn't directly sort of come back at you that oh, look at me, that kind of thing, you know. So yes, you have you see changes, but sort of hard to put it together. So you're absolutely right. We're trying to do that, but. Maybe we'll chat some other time. Don't waste everyone else's thing. I think we may, maybe we can, yeah, maybe you have some ideas about some of these molecules that may be useful. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Anand. Uh, until next week then, 8.30 Friday, bring your friends, bring your enemies, uh, bring your neighbors, <laughs> uh, everybody's invited. <laughs>